Welcome to the Bearded Dragon Crash Course, the ultimate Bearded Dragon Care Guide, where we take you from a beginner keeper to an advanced Bearded Dragon Keeper. Let's begin with what they do in the wild. These arid environments often experience hot days, but cold nights. As the spring sun rises, Bearded Dragons wait for the air temperatures of the day to start warming up their bodies. They will then begin to actively bask in the sunshine, while staying hidden until their bodies hit around 26 degrees at roughly 9.30 to 10 in the morning. After reaching this point, they emerge to sit in the bright sun and use their back like a solar panel to absorb as much of the sun's energy as possible by facing themselves away from the sun. They turn darker to do so as effectively as possible. Often the brightest patches of sun are the most energy rich are the most desirable at this time. They need to bask in the sun to warm up and get their core temperature to an optimal 36.3 degrees Celsius. During this process, the UV light is hitting their skin and is causing cholesterol in their skin to be converted into the start of the vitamin D3 cycle, allowing the calcium in their diet to be absorbed by the gut. Once they do this, they then move out of the bright sunny patch and start eating. Or males might look for a good vantage point to display to any onlooking females whilst positioning their body in a way to reduce as much of sunshine hitting their bodies as possible. Males that do get too hot jump down and press their bellies into the cool sand to expel a lot of unwanted heat. The spring rains and increasing day lengths have stimulated a lot of fresh growth in herbaceous vegetation and flowers bloom. Insects and fly populations boom alongside it. The perfect feeding time for bearded dragons is now. Rich vegetation gives the bearded dragons much needed calcium. Once the air temperatures in the middle of the day get to the point where bearded dragons don't need to keep basking to maintain their optimal body temperature, they then move to shaded positions. After the peak of midday, when bearded dragons might have fed or air temperatures begin to drop, Bearded dragons will then come out and bask in the sun for a second time to help them digest and keep some warmth for the cold night ahead. By the end of the night, all bearded dragons have returned to their shallow springtime burrows before nighttime temperatures drop to as low as freezing on some nights. It's now summertime and air temperatures are warmer than ever before and the 27 degree hot night from the day before is really felt this morning. The bearded dragons only briefly need to bask for around 10 to 20 minutes or so if they get a lucky with a meal. The sun's rays are intense and air temperatures are an all time high. Reliable amounts of food are scarce and plant matter has all but disappeared. The bearded dragons are sheltering from the sun, staying cool and avoiding basking for the most part. They don't want to raise their metabolism to need food that they won't find. As night drops, there's not a male to be seen, but females remain out, pressing their stomachs into the rocks and roads that are still warm from the day sun. As night falls, the dragons prepare to sleep on top of bushes and in trees where the now active nocturnal snake population will have more trouble sneaking up on them. At the end of autumn day hours are shortening, temperatures are dropping and winter is looming. The dragons begin to dig, digging deeper brumation burrows into the red sands that are several feet deep. These burrows remain at stable temperatures around 15 degrees celsius whilst the surface experiences the bitter cold. The bearded dragons sleep through this time in a hibernation like state. But on the occasional sunny spell in the middle of winter, the dragons will wake and bask at the mouth of their burrows to absorb as much of the warmth as they can before going back to sleep, until the air temperatures of spring rouse them and the active season starts all over again. I hope that gives you an idea of what bearded dragons might experience in the wild, and the clues that can help guide us on how to best look after them in our homes. Okay, so bearded dragons have a lot of space in the wild, so they require space in our homes. To get started, a 4x2x2 vivarium will be great for baby bearded dragons, as well as meeting the minimum needs of adult bearded dragons. Bearded dragons do get quite big, so anything less than that really restricts how much they can move. Mine is even in a 7x2x2. By two by two. Ideally, you should strive to go bigger, I have, because your bearded dragon will really appreciate that amount of room to stretch their legs and run around. Babies can go straight into that size. You don't have to worry about them getting lost in there. The wild is so much bigger. I worked in reptile stores for years and we've always just sold babies straight into a 4x2x2 and sometimes if someone's willing to spend the money, a 5x2x2. Now don't buy the starter kits like this. 
Some of the equipment's not quite right and it's not big enough for anything more than a couple of months. You can buy your 4x2x2 for as little as $299 and then buy that just once rather than buy the starter kit for $260 and then have to buy the 4x2x2 later on anyway. Just get the 4x2x2 in the first place. Saves you so much more money. So we need to provide the sun by providing our bearded dragons with special lights. To provide the sun's warmth, you need a halogen bulb or an incandescent bulb. This provides the infrared energy that most of us associate with heat. If your tank is screen top, you can fit that into a dome or if you've got a solid top, you can mount it on the inside by buying a mountable E27 fitting like I do in my enclosures. This bulb will help penetrate deep into your bearded dragon and raise their core temperatures just like the sun would in the wild. Now, the wattages of these bulbs can be very situational, but often a 100 watt bulb can be good. Remember how I said that bearded dragons will move off into the shade? We need to make sure that we give our bearded dragons that shade. You want to make sure that you provide your heat bulb onto one side of the enclosure so that that side is nice and sunny and on the other side it's cool and shaded just like nature. The entire area in the enclosure underneath that basking light is what we call the basking spot. You want your surface temperature of this basking spot to be within the sort of ballpark of 40 to 42 degrees. However, this is not as important as the temperature of your bearded dragon's back when they're basking underneath this bulb. Again, if you see that around the ballpark of 40 to 42, you're doing well. It really does need to be this hot because the bearded dragons need to be hotter on the outside so that it penetrates deep into them and can raise their body temperature at their core up to that 36 degrees. To measure this, you will need a temperature gun. It's point and shoot and it'll give you a reading of what the surface temperature of any object is on the gun. Amazon links in description. Now, if you notice that your bearded dragon is basking but it's not reaching those back temperatures, then you can up the wattage of the bulb. If your bearded dragon is doing the opposite and it's completely avoiding the basking spot and your surface temperatures are too high, then you can decrease the wattage of the bulb. Just play around up and down until you find that gold lock zone. The bearded dragon shouldn't be basking under the lamp all day long. And if it's doing that, that's telling you that it can't get its core body temperature up. Now this Goldilocks zone that I've described, you should see them bask for a little bit in the morning, go away and do things in their enclosure, and in the afternoon come back for a second bask. It's not normal for them to be sitting there all day long. I would strongly recommend using a dimming thermostat to control the heat bulb. This protects you from overheating the enclosure and it safeguards against fires. You want to have your thermostat probe in the shaded end because we want to measure air temperatures, not how much the lights can warm up the probe. The air temperatures in the enclosure can be anywhere from 20 degrees to 35 degrees. Anywhere in that ballpark is just fine. What I would do is set a thermostat to the maximum air temperature that I'm comfortable with, that being 35 degrees. Just like the thermostat probe, you want a thermometer in your shaded end reading your air temperatures so you know at all times that you can look at it and know what it is. Again, the shaded end and not the lit end because you don't want those lights heating it and raising it above to a false reading. Again, you can find them in Amazon, links in the description. Now, bearded dragons need, need UVB to survive. Bearded dragons do not have the bile acids to actually digest vitamin D in their diet, so they have to get it through making it in their skin under UV light. They need to make enough vitamin D for proper calcium absorption. Without it, your bearded dragon can suffer from metabolic bone disease and eventually die. The unit of measurement for UVB is expressed as the ultraviolet index. The stronger the radiance, the higher up the indices we get. The UVI can be measured using a solar meter 6.5. What UVI do we actually need for bearded dragons? Luckily, Bearded actually studied bearded dragons in the wild. And out of 112 bearded dragons found, they found that the average was a UVI of four. So we need something to give our bearded dragons a UVI of four in their enclosures. Luckily, there are special UVB lamps that are made for us to put over enclosures to do just that. What you want is the linear tubes, not the spiral bulbs, because they're too weak. Different bulbs have different strengths, and these are often marked as percentages. So how does percentage link to UVI? Well, the higher the percentage, the higher the UVI is an equal distance to the basking spot than a lower percentage bulb. So our bearded dragons need a UVI of four and a lower percentage bulb would need to be much closer to the dragon to achieve that UVI of four. 
but a higher percentage bulb would need to be a greater distance away to achieve that same UVI of 4 at the same basking spot. So if you're looking to use Arcadia, that would be a 12% bulb at 30 centimeters away, or a 14% bulb at 45 centimeters away. Remember, it's not just the distance of your enclosure, the height of the enclosure, it's actually the distance from the actual bulb to the back of your bearded dragon where it's going to be basking. For Zoom Ed 10.0 bulbs, you would get a UVI of 4 at 30 centimeters away. On a Reptile Systems Zone 3 bulb with a reflector, would get a UVI of 4 at 30 centimeters away. Use each brand's guidance on how their bulbs work at different distances. So you want to position your UV bulb next to your heat lamp clustered to one end. So again, we're creating that patch of sunshine and then that area of shade for them to move in and out of basking and bright light and shade, just like nature. You don't want your UV bulbs to be any more than one third to one half the length of the enclosure. Leave that other half for shade. Now you need to replace these bulbs for the UV once a year because the bulbs degrade over time. So check with the brand's guidance and make sure you're following the best way to keep them up to date. Now remember how I said in that story how bearded dragons will select a basking spot based upon how bright it is. Now brightness equals quality in the eyes of a bearded dragon. So in our tank we need to make sure that our little patch of sunlight is nice and bright. Now we can do that by adding LEDs to our basking spot. You can use LED spotlights like the Sansa lamps from Amazon that screw right into a dome or an E27 fitting. Or you can actually get LED bars like the Arcadia Jungle Dawn or the Retro Systems New Dawn but again place that one third to a half the enclosure so they're making sure that they're getting that shade. Once these three types of bulbs are clustered together at the basking spot, we're now getting very much closer to having our nice little patch of sunshine. I would recommend having these lights on for 12 hours a day. So for example, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and then turned off at night. They need darkness at night to go to sleep just like us and that temperature drop at night is really good for their immune systems. Temperatures can get really low in Australia, really really cold nights in Australia so letting your tank go down to the low 60s at night is absolutely no bother. In fact one of the main reasons that a bearded dragon might not feel the need to bask in the morning is if their nighttime temperatures were too high the night before. So if you're finding that it's really hot at night in your house and it's not basking in the morning, it might just be that it didn't need to. So turn all your lighting and heating off at night. Unless you're living somewhere where it's freezing, then I would give them a non-light emitting heat source at night just to keep them warm, but it doesn't wake them up by producing light. But for most of us, we're not keeping our bearded dragons in an area that gets that cool. Most of us have them in bedrooms or living rooms. So for the most part, you can just use a timer plug on the wall. Like in my life with the Bearded Dragon story at the start, Bearded Dragons live in areas of sands and soils. So what we can do for our pets in our home is give them a mixture of top soil to play sand or just straight sand. There's many types of commercially available sands that we can use for our Bearded Dragons. Substrate is important for Bearded Dragons because it provides cushioning on their joints so they aren't on really hard surfaces all the time. It allows them to dig, which they are really motivated to do. Don't use things like reptile carpets or tile. They can get their claws stuck and ripped out. If you don't give them loose substrate, it can actually result in a loss of muscle mass and cause a lot of stress on the joints, which might manifest itself in arthritis later on down the line. Bearded dragons like to shelter under logs and trees and hollows at certain times of the year in the wild. So in our tanks at home, give them branches, things to be in, on, under, the whole shebang. In the summer, they will sleep in those trees and on those bushes. So given that little bit of height, they will really enjoy that. You will find that the males in captivity especially will really enjoy those vantage points that we give them and sit up there and bubble away and do all their territory displaying. Bearded dragons hydrate through the water that comes in the food they eat. Now vegetation provides bearded dragons with a lot of moisture content. However, it does also rain in the wild and their puddles do form, so there's the option for them to drink from puddles. So in captivity, give them a water bowl. Now in the wild, humidity is cyclical. And what I mean by that is it rises at night, and then during the peak of the day, the midday, it burns off and comes up again. So it goes around this circle of up, down, up, down, as the day and nights proceed. So in the middle of the day, it might be as low as 20%, but in the mornings and evenings, it might be 65%, and at night, it might be 80%, and in the burrow, it might be plus 80%. 
You don't need to generally panic about humidity. It's only when things are cold and wet constantly that bearded dragons can get respiratory infections. People breed them outside in Florida all year round and do quite well. So it's about physical wetness rather than humidity. Like at the moment, this room is sitting at 70% humidity, but there isn't like water dripping on the walls. It's about wetness and coldness that causes those RIs. So as long as your enclosure is dry and warm, you'll be all right. Bearded dragons get so overfed in captivity to the point where most of them are obese and the keepers don't realize. It should naturally take a bearded dragon to get to adult size in two years. Yet in captivity, we're feeding them so much that so some people get them to that size in like three months. If you feed them too much, it can lead to gout and other problems. It also puts a lot of stress on the livers and can cause liver failure in some dragons. The best thing to do is to grow them slowly and also you get to enjoy that baby phase for far longer. You only want to feed baby bearded dragons around five prey items once a day that are between the size between their eyes and then you can provide them with fresh vegetation every day. Now once a baby bearded dragon gets to around 30 grams that feeding day can go to every second day. Keep your bearded dragon lean. If it starts getting fat around the midsection you can take that back to every third day. With adults you only need to feed sort of like five insects between the sides, between their eyes, every two days a week maybe, and a bowl of greens around the size of the bearded dragon's head three days a week. They do not need to eat every day. And then, like I say, increase and decrease portion size based on the animal's body condition. When you realise how little a bearded dragon actually needs, you realise where so many are obese in captivity. Now, I do recommend rotating your feeder insects so you get a balanced diet of many different types of bugs in the diet of your bearded dragon. There are a lot of greens that you can feed your bearded dragon. Obviously, what I recommend is a varied and balanced diet. There are a lot of feeding guides and charts out there on what you can actually feed your bearded dragon, but here are a few. Endive, spring greens, kale. Rocket, or to you Americans, that's arugula, I think. Dandelions, plantain, sow thistle, clover, bittercress, globe artichoke, snapdragon. There's a lot of things that you can feed them. Just make sure that it's safe for a bearded dragon. Don't feed them fruit because it causes bloating in the stomach and causes dental disease. And there's no reason to do it. They don't eat fruit in the wild. They don't get fruit in the wild. So there's no reason to feed them in captivity. In terms of supplements, calcium is the main one that people think of. Calcium is needed for neurons to communicate, for healthy bone growth, and so much more. Most vertebrates need twice as much calcium in their blood to phosphorus. And insects don't actually store calcium because they don't have a skeleton. So that, and they're mostly phosphorus. So we need to make sure that we put calcium powders on our bugs so that twice as much calcium to phosphorus is going in in their diet. Now, in terms of multivitamins, if you're providing them with a varied diet of both the bugs and the vegetation, they should be pretty good. But multivitamins are there to sweep through after and fill in the gaps and just elevate things after the fact. So multivitamins are quite potent. You don't need to use them very often, but sprinkle them on, on your bugs once every two weeks to a month in the same way you would do calcium and you're absolutely fine. Like I said in the story at the start of this video, in the summer, there's very little food and it's very hot and bearded dragons don't want to bask and elevate their metabolism to need food they won't find. So they'll shy away and go into a state called estivation. Now this is entirely different from brumation and hibernation that occurs in the winter. Many people see their bearded dragons estivating in captivity because they're naturally going to do that in the summer when our rooms get really hot and they think they're hibernating but they're just estivating. If they're alert and awake and looking around but just sitting in the cool end, in the shaded end, that's absolutely fine. It's not hibernation. Hibernation or brumation is when they go in deep sleeps in burrows in the winter. What they're going to do is go into a corner of the vivarium where it's cool and are probably in a hide and just hunker down and start sleeping through the winter. So in captivity what I would do is keep the basking spot exactly the same, don't change the temperatures and just reduce the daylight hours going into winter so the less hours are heating the vivarium and naturally the air temperature will drop. Then you would take that down into winter, start feeding around mid-October, don't give them food, let them sleep through winter and then coming into spring Start bringing that back up again, bring them out into the active period. Do all of that whilst not letting them go beneath 15 degrees and you'll be golden. Now, are you ready for advanced? I think we can go advanced now. So let's go back to revisiting the basking spot. Yes, much of the principles remain the same. However, 
knowing what we're truly trying to achieve in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum of light of sunlight is a whole other ballpark. So sunlight is broken up into differing wavelengths all across the spectrum measured in nanometers. So for this video, we're gonna focus on what's terrestrially available and biologically relevant to what we're trying to do. So we are looking at the spectrum of the sun measured in nanometers. From around 290 to 320 nanometers is UVB. From around 320 to 350 nanometers ish is the portion of uva that's involved with uvb in the regulation of vitamin d3 from around 350 to 400 nanometers is the portion of uva that's associated with reptile vision this is where bitter dragons can see colors that we cannot even comprehend from around 400 to 700 is where the visible light spectrum occurs everything that we can see as in the colors of the rainbow. From around 700 to 1400, although this chart here ends at 900, is infrared A, the part we generally associate with basking heat. So what we want to do when giving our bearded dragons that nice sunny patch is make sure we're representing as much of that spectrum and the different categories as much as possible. So if we take a look at the traditional old style basic setup of a heat lamp and a UV lamp, we basically have one end and the other end of the spectrum because that's the bare minimum that will keep a bearded dragon alive but it's leaving this whole middle section missing this is entirely unnatural the good thing to note is that linear uvb tubes from the likes of zoom med Reptosystems, systems and arcadia represent the uvb wavelengths of sunlight very well so getting that right is as simple as turning the bulb on and making sure you have the right uvi it also does provide a little bit of visible light, but not enough to fully represent that category. Next, let's look at infrared A. Now this is where our heat lamps come in. This represents the infrared portion of the sunlight effectively. But then we have that huge gap, like I just said before, where visible light is uncatered to. And this is where LEDs come in. It provides some of the colors that the animals need to see well, as well as contributing to warming the dragon up. LED bars are great for adding background levels of light and colors. However, this is still so dim compared to sunlight. Outside on a cloudy day in the middle of winter in the UK at 2 p.m. it's 40,000 lux and all of these lights are so dim that they only come to 11,000 lux. By adding an LED spotlight I increase the lux to just surpass that of a UK winter's day. This is why we need to add visible light intensity to our basking spots. These animals are from the bright Australian arid lands and we're keeping them so dark in captivity. The alertness and activity levels of a bearded dragon when it has that level of brightness, you will see a night and day difference in your animal. What is left is the portion of UVA that affords bearded dragons the rest of their vision. This can be provided by adding a metal halide to the mix. This fills in this missing spot nicely. The metal halide is the next thing on my list to add to my basking spot. However, metal halides, there's a little bit more to it than either own external ballast system, and there's a little bit more to do. So if you're uncomfortable with that or unable to do that, then the LED spotlight is good to go. Just like the beginner section of this video, you want it all clustered to one end so we can afford to drag in the shade at the other end of the enclosure. You can mount them internally like I have here. I'm using the Reptosystems Systems Gold Bar, which does the same job as a heat bulb, but it's just in a different form factor. Notice how I've angled it to be beneath the LED bar and the UVB bulb. I've done that so they group together and the light blends nicely. On the other side, I have my LED spotlight angled beneath as well. Now, if you have a screen top enclosure, angling can be quite difficult if you're just placing things flat on the mesh. You could sort of work out some sort of wooden structure on this rig to like angle it all, or you could buy something like the Thermal Zoo Pro from Arcadia. This basically angles all the bulbs for you in this big metal chassis that does the work for you. Again, I made a review video with the Arcadia Thermal Zoo Pro, so check that out on this channel. Now, let's talk about how to measure the output and intensity of these lamps so that our basking spots are just right. So just like how I talked about UVI in the beginner portion, infrared also has its own unit of measurement and that is watts per meter squared, otherwise known as power density. Now this is a recent revelation for reptile keeping and a lot of the data that was collected on bearded dragons was done prior to us all knowing about this. So there's lots of data on surface temperatures, but not a lot on power density. Again, we're moving on from surface temperatures because it isn't technically correct. And as advanced keepers, we're going to do this properly. Like I said, we don't have any data on what 
power density bearded dragons are basking at in the wild, but we can make an educated guess. A very hot sunny day with intense infrared might be around 300 watts per meter squared, and that would be a good ballpark to shoot for. And again, to measure this, we need another tool, a power meter. This is the ISM 400 power meter. Again, links. The way a typical incandescent bulb usually works is it supplies power to heat a tungsten filament to a temperature to the point where it reaches irradiance. And unlike UV and UVI, it doesn't degrade in a linear fashion with dimming. Actually, once you dim a bulb past roughly 80%, the power density just drops. This is why we need to run our bulbs as close to full power as possible. So what we need to do is change the wattage and swap out bulbs to manipulate things to change the power density to get what we want, because otherwise dimming it just ruins it. So for example, if a 75 watt bulb was only reaching 180 watts per meter squared, you could cycle up to 100 watt, and that might get you a 300 watts per meter squared. It's about changing the wattages. The reason that surface temperatures are not accurate because it's entirely variable on what actual object you're reading. For example, imagine you have two identical heat lamps, right? They're both 100 watts. They're both theoretically the same power density, but one is over grass and one is over some black slate. The black slate will have a much higher surface temperature than the grass because both objects have completely different thermal masses. This is why surface temperature is not a good indicator of power density. Now surface temperatures are still important to make sure that things are at safe and comfortable temperatures within bounds of reason. You could have exactly 300 watts per meter squared of energy from a heat lamp but it's over a thin piece of black slate and it's upwards of 65 degrees celsius. But that'd be absolutely fine at 40 degrees celsius over sand. So we're not using this as a measurement of the output of our lamps but rather just how warm things are getting. The LEDs are much easier, it's a case of just turning them on. Now let's swing back to those air temperatures. Like I said, you do not want to dim those incandescents, but if we're not dimming it and we're running everything at full output, there's going to be a lot of heat generated as a byproduct of these lights. So how do we control the air temperature in these enclosures? If you look at care guides online, most of them will say something like, oh, you want your cool end temperature to, air temperature to be this, you want your midway air temperature to be this, and your hot end air temperature to be this. It's completely wrong. That's just not how physics works. What's nice is you actually only need to worry about one air temperature. Now let me explain. Imagine yourself standing in a field with a single tree. It's a hot sunny day and you want to cool down. So you go into the shade of that tree. Now what happened was you moved from radiation upon you to being out of radiation. The air temperature in that field did not change. Only where radiation could reach changed. That's exactly what happens in a reptile's tank. The air doesn't change every couple of inches down the length of an enclosure. That's physically the physically not possible. It's just that some of the enclosure is under the lights and has radiation upon it and some does not. It's light and shade. So when people are reading different air temperatures across their enclosure, what they're actually doing is seeing how much they can warm up the thermometer in different portions of, of light in, in their tank. Now I did an experiment with a cheap light box and a digital thermometer. Simply by having LEDs on the thermometer, the thermometer warmed up and got an elevated reading. This is what keepers are doing and tricking themselves. So to control our air temperatures, we want to put our thermostat probe in the cool end, so it's measuring the true air temperature. Then we're setting that thermostat probe to the highest amount we're comfortable with. The reason we're doing that is that our basking spot stays on until things become uncomfortably hot, let's say during summer heat wave and the air temperatures rise to a dangerous level, then that thermostat will kill the basking spot. What we're doing is using the thermostat as a safety feature alone and not using it to control the output of, of the basking spot at all points of the day. And then we can use fans to control our temperatures. Having fans blowing in low and then fans sucking out high, what we're doing is we're pulling out the excess hot air, leaving a gap that needs to be filled from air behind it. So we're pulling in cool air and pushing out hot air and getting a really good ventilation circle in our enclosure. 
You can even hook these fans up to a thermostat using the same method. But what should these air temperatures actually be? Well, I've taken a lot of climate data and merged three different weather stations across Australia, one more southern, one midway, and one more northern. Take a look at this temperature graph. I've collected it in both Celsius and Fahrenheit, and I've flipped the data for the northern hemisphere. What you'll notice is the average air temperatures are cooler than most imagine. Remember that bearded dragons are very good at using the sun to elevate their body temperature way higher than that of their surrounding environment. So when bearded dragons get hot in the sun, but then also get the cold nights, that's what allows them to switch off and then switch on and ramp up that immune system. One thing to be taken into account is these are broad averages across many years. The daily rise and fall also happens. For example, just because the average in March was 16 degrees Celsius, it doesn't mean that it's constantly that low. On several days in March 2013, midday temps could be as high as 27. So this data is not a strict rule to abide by, but rather give you an overall understanding. That's why I say shooting for an ambient anywhere between 20 and 35 is fine, and we allow those natural fluctuations of day and night to occur. Then we allow them to drop and cool going into brumation and rise coming out, but the advanced way of doing that we'll mention later. Next, let's look at the lowest nighttime temperatures. This is the lowest recorded nighttime temperature each month for the last five years. Do you see how cold it gets in the winter next to freezing? So those burrows really are crucial in the winter to keep them at a stable 15 degrees, despite the bitter cold on the surface. Now, remember how I said that humidity fluctuates? Well, I graph that out too. You'll notice that humidity on average rises in the winter, but drops in the summer. The ebb and flow of humidity is entirely, entirely normal. If you look at rainfall over the year, the summer gets the most storms and rain, but because the temperatures are so high during the peak of the day, the humidity gets burnt off quickly. So what I do is spray the enclosure down more frequently in the summer to simulate this rain. Now, remember when you've got this suitable ventilation and using fans to blow in and suck out air, you can spray these enclosures, get that spike in humidity, but then it also can drop down and be pulled out after. Trying to replicate the seasonal difference of rainfall isn't entirely necessary because many bitter dragons have lived and bred successfully for many years, only relying on hydration from food and a water bowl. But it does add complexity and variability to an animal's life that is ultimately, in the end, very enriching. Speaking of seasonal cycling, here is the average day length per month. You'll notice that it peaks in the summer summer months and drops in the winter. The difference of four hours makes a difference over the course of a year. So since we're still on the topic of seasons, let's topic brumation properly. Like I mentioned previously, they will brumate in burrows that stabilize around 15 degrees. And on sunny days in the winter, they'll come out and bask at the mouths of their burrows. So we want our basking spot temperatures and outputs and everything to remain the same, but we're going to regulate and manipulate are day lengths. What this means is that we're heating them for less hours of the day and it naturally means that air temperatures are going to be cooler throughout that season. So somewhere around mid-October I then cease feeding, give them some time to digest and then early November I will take their day period down to eight hours. This causes the beginning of overall cooler temperatures and cooling down into winter. Now you'll notice that from 12 hours to eight that's the four hour difference that they also would experience in the wild but what I like to do is take it down further and take it down to six hours. So I do that around mid-November. So the reason that I'm going all the way down to six and not just stopping at eight in that four hour difference is in captivity, we're using that to manipulate the air temperatures as well. And a lot of us can't get our temperatures that low because they're in bedrooms or living rooms, like I say. So we're going hard on the day length drop to stimulate them because we might not be able to go as hard on the temperatures, if that makes sense. Plus in the wild, most days they spend in a burrow, in a captivity, they might do that in a hide. But when they do wake up on those warm days to bask, they've got their six hours to bask in. Around mid-February, I bring it back up to eight hours. And around early March, I bring it back up to the full shebang, 12 hours lighting regime. So like I said before, bearded dragons are eating way too much in captivity and their calcium requirements are two to one. If that isn't achieved, bearded dragons will withdraw calcium from storage in the bones to bring back into the blood serum to create equilibrium back to that two one status. This is a survival mechanism that works great for the short term in the wild because when calcium becomes available again, that gets packed on back into storage and 
all was fine. The problem is when people get it wrong in captivity and underprovide calcium or do things in the, what I'm going to mention in a minute that make the calcium requirements skyrocket. Now a baby bearded dragon whose skeleton body is growing might actually have an increased calcium requirement of 5 to 1. Like I said before the bugs we feed don't store calcium and are just pure phosphorus. So when people are feeding buckets load of bugs to their bearded dragons and as much as they can eat within 15 minutes what they're actually doing is putting bucket loads of phosphorus into the animal requiring skyrocketing needs of calcium to counteract that. You can drive calcium requirements as high as 15 to 1 in some cases and at that point it's very very difficult to even get that amount of calcium into them because at that point you're delivering it with phosphorus as well. Not to mention the huge amount of proteins that's going into these animals causing their muscles and stuff to grow faster than their skeletons can naturally healthily grow alongside it. AKA, that's why they need to grow much slower on that five a day rule. Like I said before, it's important that the greens are varied and they get that varied composition of greens because different ones have different macro and micronutrient profiles. So the advanced way of doing it is also doing everything I said before and using your shop bought veg, but also foraging for wild greens out and about yourself. Now this is that upper level of a truly varied diet. Now the caveats to this is knowing your area, knowing when and where pesticides have been sprayed. If you're ne next to a farmer's field and you know that he's spraying everything, maybe don't collect from there. I use the app called Picture This. You can take a picture of a plant and the app identifies it. Then I like to use another app to see if the plant is safe to feed to my bearded dragon. This app is called the Tortoise Table. It uses a traffic light system of green, amber and red. Greens feed away, amber is in moderation and red is just don't. But read the descriptions of each weed that you're looking at to make sound decisions. I go on a walk to pick the weeds that I know and I bring them back and I wash them under the tap and then feed them to my dragon. In the wild the dragons are eating plants that have calcium to phosphorus ratios within themselves of 20 to 1. So this is where the calcium in the wild bearded dragon's diet is mainly coming from. So let's talk about how to do feed their insects properly. Now I'm going to mainly focus on crickets here because that's what's most commonly available to most people in the in the US when you have ag agriculture laws and in Europe and also it's the most commonly researched feeder insect. Now crickets have good amounts of amino acids and other nutrients but they're low in calcium, vitamin A, D, E and they have an inverse omega-6 to omega-3 ratio compared to most wild insects anyway. So this is why we gut load our crickets to improve the nutritional quality and fill in those gaps before we feed it to our bearded dragon. Now in the 80s and 90s gut loading most commonly referred to just feeding calcium to crickets so it raised them to a one-to-one -one ratio but nowadays it commonly refers to just feeding them to deliver other nutrients as well. In studies it was found that if crickets were kept at anything below 26 degrees Celsius, they would not achieve a one-to-one -one ratio. Crickets also ate more in hiding places that made them feel secure. So take that in mind when you're placing food for your crickets. It then took 48 hours for this one-to-one -one ratio to be achieved and they quickly dropped off after 72 hours. So when we're gut loading for our dragons, we need to make sure we're doing this 48 hours before we feed them off. The real kicker here is that you can't feed high calcium diets to crickets long term because it kills them. So only feed these high calcium gut loading formulas to crickets that you've separated and are looking to feed off in 48 hours time. If you're truly using that gut loading formula, using things like apple slices for the moisture content actually just distracts the crickets and makes them fill up their guts and not eat as much as their formula, ruining the ratios that come out in the crickets in the long term. So what I recommend is maintaining a group of crickets on a maintenance diet and then the ones you want to gut load, take them out in a separate container of the portion that you're looking to feed off and do that 48 hours before you're going to feed your dragon. For vitamin A, the commercial diets were really good at delivering it, so include that in your gut loading diet. Now the precursors to vitamin A, like carotenoids and like beta carotene, also were found to accumulate in the flesh of crickets when fed them over a long period of time. And the same was found for vitamin E. So what I'd recommend is feeding things that are high in this in the crickets maintenance diet because you can accrue that and accumulate that over time. So things like carrots, bell peppers, squash in like pumpkin for example. So what's going to happen is they're going to eat that over a long period of time that's going to accrue in their actual flesh and not be in the stomach and then when you move them to their gut loading diet and that's all about packing that and filling their stomach for their bearded dragon to eat them as a whole you've then double whammied on the nutritional quality 
of your cricket. Luckily, our bearded dragons make their own vitamin D with proper UV, so we don't have to worry about that in gut loading. What you can actually do is improve the omega-6 to omega-3 ratios by including flaxseed oil in the gut loading diet that you feed to your crickets. Now, what I want to stress is not all gut loading diets are the same. In some studies, they kept the crickets exactly the same in like a scientific manner, and some formulas absolutely failed and got nowhere near a one-to-one -one ratio of calcium, and some did it really well. So the diets that actually got good results in studies are the following. Missouri Better Bug, Rapashi Superload, Zygler Monster Cricket Diet, T-Rex Cricket Diet Dust, and Wombaroo Insect Powder. And then like I said, you're also supplementing and using powders, putting calcium on the bugs. Also make sure that you're getting more than that 2 to 1 ratio when that animal goes into your bearded dragon's mouth. Now be aware, in studies it was found that within 2 minutes, crickets could clean off up to 50% of powder on them. So you need to make sure of how quickly your bearded dragon's actually eating them versus if you just chuck them in the enclosure and allow your bearded dragon to hunt, that's great, that's great enrichment, but just keep in mind that those crickets can go off and clean that powder off. This is where gut loading is extremely helpful in that scenario because it takes a lot longer for a cricket to void its gut content than it does to clean itself off. So using tactic A and tactic B at the same time is the most efficient result you're going to get when feeding your dragon. What's really unfortunate is a lot of the nutritional needs of reptiles are not really understood. The reason that we know it exactly to the exact number in cats and dogs is they did some hardcore like soulless studies in the back in the day where they would maintain an animal at a certain level of a nutrient and did it get deficient or was it fine? Did it overdose at that or was it not? Nowadays you have like ethics in studies that you wouldn't allow you to do that to an animal anymore. So we will never know that with, with our reptiles. So a lot of the recommendations are based on the National Research Council's recommendations for lab rats, which is less than ideal, but there you go. The reason I tell you that is because multivitamin powders are so potent they far exceed the NCI recommendations for rats, but they're meant to be used infrequently anyway. So like I said before in the beginner bit, use it once every two weeks on one set of crickets to once a month. And then what I would do is have multiple brands of multivitamin powders and just cycle through them because we don't really know what the values are supposed to be. So just spreading it thin means that you've probably covered your basis. Now the average wild weight of a female bearded dragon was 254 grams and the average male was 372 grams. And the overall weight was 341 grams. You don't want your dragon being any more than 10 to 15% over the weight of like a wild dragonwood. So ideally that's a female that's no more than 290 grams or a male that's no more than 430 grams using that 15%. But that's not all. We did get the world's leading expert Bidivet on a Zoom call to look at our bearded dragon's body condition. And this is what he said. Okay, so out of five, I would say that this dragon here is about oh, upside down. Um, I would say it's almost smack bang on perfect. So use my bearded dragon's body condition as a guide for yourself, because that's what Beauty Vert said was near perfect. In the wild, obviously substrate varies from habitat to habitat, but in one location, Bidivet actually collected some of that soil and sent it to a university to get its composition analysed. I've sent some of the sand off to a uh, the lab at uh, Southern Cross University and the result is in so 0.3% uh, gravel 95.9% .9 sand about one and a half percent silt and the only thing the only content of clay is it's only 2.3% clay the wild substrate has that hard crust which really helps the bearded dragons dig those burrows and it hold its form. So we know that substrates in the wild are very sand heavy. In the past I've actually taken a lot of commercially available red sands for bearded dragons and mixed them together and I included a little bit of excavator clay so that it would hold its structure. And what I did was pour it into the enclosure whilst moist and wet and then whilst the bearded dragon was out of the enclosure I turned all the heating and lighting on a full power and I baked it and that surface got that nice crust and it actually replicated that texture perfectly. Or you can actually buy wild substrates from the habitat of bearded dragons shipped straight out of Australia and just use that. Link in the description. I have a number of branches that are 
arranged to overlap in the far right corner to offer my bearded dragon that little bit of height. I've also made sure there's some cork hides and tunnels beneath that. So if she wants to go down into the log pile for some cooler temperatures, she can. A really good plant to use is mint. This has actually been found in the wild diet of bearded dragons. And with a deep enough substrate that locks in that human microclimate for the roots of that plant, it's going to go wild. And that bearded dragon can sit there and pick on that and eat all day long. Other things you can include are crests like carex grasses, like actual actual lawn grass seeds and like let that sprout in there snake plants aloe vera elephant feed and a whole lot more let me know what you think of these videos of this depth and length look at the other videos on this channel i've done a lot of in-depth guides and i'll see you in the next video